So we're ready to uh, get things started or should we wait another minute? We can start already. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for uh, Elliot and uh, Sama for uh, putting this together. Um, I think this is going to be a, a good topic for uh, for your audience here and really appreciate uh, Dale and Amit uh, joining in and bringing their uh, expertise because, uh, yeah, I, I'm actually uh, hoping to uh, learn a few things here as we're uh, going through this topic as well. So um, I'll kind of kick things off here going through. Uh, so I'm Jerry Ellen, one of the product managers at Aka House. So I figured uh, we'll kind of tee things up here uh, talking about Aka House products first. And uh, you know that'll segue and kind of tie in nicely, I think, into the um, you know the, the topic at, at hand here about uh, Wi-Fi and retail environments. Um, so yeah, first thing we're going to talk about is the Echo Connect uh, solution and introduce you guys to that. And then we're going to talk about uh, you know, knowing your surroundings, you know, when it comes to these retail environments. And then uh, the the last part is going to be spending some time talking about these technical rec uh, recommendations here, and uh, Amit and Dale will be uh, covering those uh, pretty extensively, and uh, I may have some value to to add there, and uh, we'll chime in if I can. All right. So first thing we want to talk about is the Echo Connect solution. So if you haven't heard of Echo Connect, uh, really, uh, you know, and just Echo in general here, this is what this uh, is kind of encompassing here is, you know, we're all about great Wi-Fi. And to do that, delivering the tools and the training uh, for uh, Wi-Fi experts to be able to do that. So being able to design high capacity Wi-Fi networks. Uh, being able to validate you know, uh, after the deployment, as well as maybe uh, troubleshooting in a, an already existing deployment that you may have inherited that's having some problems or you need to refresh. Um, and then also being able to have the tools to uh, do that ongoing maintenance, be able to analyze and troubleshoot Wi-Fi issues in real time. Uh, so what do those products or, or tools include? Um, this is really the, the whole solution kind of overview. Um, uh, and I'm getting a little bit of background noise, so if uh, if you're on the call, if you can uh, uh, mute, uh, that would be much appreciated. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the solution components here. This is the software and hardware that make up the uh, the Echo Connect solution and enable you to do all those great things I just mentioned in the previous slide. So you've got the flagship product, that's the Echo Pro tool. That's going to be your desktop, laptop application that runs on both Windows and Mac. And then you've got the hardware component, the Echo Sidekick, that's going to enable you to do those validations and do the uh, the troubleshooting, do those very precise Wi-Fi. Uh, measurements uh, for for troubleshooting analysis and validation um, and then you've got the uh, new tools here the bottom three there are the new tools that make up the echo connect solution and that uh, are things like echo survey for iPad this is a industry first professional tool uh, Wi-Fi uh, tool for the iPad uh, to be able to do Wi-Fi measurements using a you know nice touchscreen lightweight device uh, like the iPad and then we have the echo capture tool uh, that enhances the whole uh, echo how kind of troubleshooting and validation capabilities by giving you that really uh, allowing you to capture that really granular level information that packet level information um, really useful for uh, advanced and in-depth uh, troubleshooting um, and then you've got the Echo Cloud uh, component of that that allows you to collaborate on these project files, have a centralized place to store your project files, and also just uh, it makes it very easy to um, share these project files, either sharing them between devices, so between like your laptop and your iPad, or to share them even with other teams members within your organization so you can collaborate on a project in real time uh, even if you're in remote locations. So the Echo Pro tool, um, just to kind of highlight a few kind of key features there. Um, this is really the industry standard tool when it comes to designing, analyzing, optimizing, and troubleshooting Wi-Fi networks. Uh, very easy to get up and running with, so you can create Wi-Fi designs in you know uh, literally minutes. And then you've got things like uh, 2,500 different access points and antennas that you can use to model these networks in 3D, so you can figure out exactly the right model access point, the right vendor, um, the right antenna that you want to use. Um, uh, Amit, Dale, do you guys use uh, any type of external antennas in any of the, the retail environments that you guys uh, work in? Um, in my retail stores, we don't, but um, we do use them in uh, some of our warehouses. Yeah, very, very common. Um, 
And yeah, even in a, a retail environment, if you're getting into the situation where you're, you know, very densely deploying APs, uh, sometimes having those directional antennas to kind of shape that signal and, and minimize things like co-channel interference and lower the noise, uh, increasing your SNR can be uh, of good value and you can model all that in the uh, the tool. But yeah, very common in those kind of higher ceiling environments, right? And that's what I was going to say. We do have some locations that do have higher ceilings, and that's where we do deploy um, some of those external um, patch antennas. Awesome. Yeah, so that can be uh, useful to have all those uh, at your fingertips. Um, but then also some different design profiles, and we'll get into that more into the uh, um, you know into the meat of the the webinar here and some of the, the topics about different profiles depending on what you're designing for. So whether you're designing for a, a voice grade Wi-Fi network or you just need basic data, we've got the profiles already preset in there. But then you can also customize those and add your own as well. Um, and then also the other beauty is the uh, Echo Pro tool is not just a planning tool. It also works with the Echo Sidekick to be able to provide those fast and accurate on-site site surveys. And as I mentioned, it runs on both Windows and Mac OS. Um, we just recently re uh, released this uh, Echo Pro version 10, which adds a bunch of new features in here. Uh, highlighted a few of them here on this slide. I won't uh, read through all of these here, but really a focus is around uh, improving performance, uh, bringing the you know, latest standards, the, the Wi-Fi 6 uh, standards into the tool for both planning and surveying, um, and then also more collaboration capabilities, so better note taking, uh, picture notes, things like that, and just better accuracy when it comes to AP placement, uh, visualization engine, uh, also identifying interferers. We have a new interference classification capability as well. Uh, the Sidekick, if you're not familiar with this, uh, this has been around uh, for a little while now. This is our all-in-one purpose-built Wi-Fi measurement device. Um, and now we've brought this, uh, it previously was available for Windows and Mac OS. And now with the uh, launch of Echo Connect, we also uh, added uh, capabilities of connecting this to a, uh, an Apple iPad as well. Um, and then, yeah, we've got uh, two Wi-Fi radios in there, as well as uh, a dedicated spectrum analyzer. So this is going to provide lightning fast uh, Wi-Fi measurements, and uh, not just fast, but accurate is a big uh, thing here. So in the past, you've probably leveraged things like USB Wi-Fi adapters, you know, kind of off the shelf things that weren't, weren't purpose built for Wi-Fi measurement, usually have, you know, very small antennas in them, um, you know, maybe one or two antennas in them, where the Sidekick actually has seven different antennas in there. And what that provides is a greater level of accuracy when it comes to Wi-Fi measurements. So it doesn't, you don't have to worry about, you know, how is this thing orientated or anything? It's designed to be worn a certain way. So you're always gonna get good, accurate measurements. You don't have to be a, you know, an RF expert or anything to, to use this tool, but the, the data that it provides is very useful to a, a Wi-Fi expert to, to analyze and troubleshoot. Also has a built-in battery, so that uh, cuts down on uh, the downtime of recharging things. So this thing will last eight hours of continuous uh, surveying, and uh, you know to power all that external kind of uh, those external radios uh, doesn't use your internal battery to do that like uh, kind of previous generation measurement devices did. Also has its own built-in storage, so that's great for being able to kind of back up your project files and have them uh, on a separate device. It also makes it very portable to be able to move those project files around between different users. And this just kind of illustrates that accuracy piece that I was mentioning. So, you know, you could use something like, uh, you know, this USB uh, Wi-Fi adapter on the bottom there, and you can kind of see the results between the two. Um, so the sidekick is going to paint a much better accurate picture and make sure that you get things done right the first time and don't have to resurvey areas to try and figure out, you know, was that a, an anomaly or was that actually, um, you know, a, a coverage hole issue in that particular area. So then the uh, survey for iPad, um, you know, you can kind of uh, connect the dots there of the, the benefits of you've used an iPad before, you know, much lighter weight than walking around with a laptop. Um, obviously, the whole touchscreen experience, uh, you know, adds a, a, an ease of use, uh, you know, piece to that. So it's much easier to get up and running with. And really, you can put this in the hands of, uh, you know, any user. It doesn't have to be a Wi-Fi expert. And they can walk around and just tap the map of where they're standing. And the sidekick is going to do all the, the heavy lifting there of collecting all those measurements. And then your expert could be on the other end of that automatically uh, receiving and, and analyzing those results. 
Well, that's everything I've got on the uh, the Echo product side. I'll be uh, around here uh, watching the chat. So if you do have any you know product specific questions, I will do my best to uh, answer those. Um, I'll also throw my email in the uh, the chat there. But I'm going to go ahead and stop my uh, screen share here so Dale can uh, share his screen, and uh, I'll let uh, let you guys take over uh, on the uh, the real interesting stuff. Very much. Jerry. Alrighty. Thanks, Jerry. I um, just don't, I don't see the option to share yet. Let me see. I think you might need to make him present. Sorry about that. I've, pa I've passed uh, the ball. Uh, no problem. <laughs> okay. So here we go. And. Okay. So Mitt will begin here. Yeah. So uh, uh, th thanks uh, for taking the time to to join us uh, and just to uh, get an insight of what we what we do in in our uh, sort of day to day role. So we're, we're talking about retail, as you know. Um, there's you know different types of retail stores um, that you have, in, in even though we're one vertical, there's different types of um, the, the stores that you have. So, um, you know, some of those are supermarkets where you have, uh, you know, groceries, different types of uh, products, electronics, um, laptops, TVs, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you may have another type of retail location, which is like a sort of like a Costco, uh, where it's more of a warehouse style. So racks are quite high compared to a uh, maybe like a supermarket. And um, the third one that we're looking at is also uh, maybe like a clothing or apparel store where you we have um, much uh, smaller uh, store sizes, um, probably lower ceilings, and um, the majority of your your, your product is going to be clothing. Um, and so, what's 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 common about those is um, you know all all those all those uh, types of stores are going to have. Uh, similar types of devices um, to perform those retail operations, right? So you, you're going to have like your um, your POS um, areas, you're going to have your back office area where they're doing um, business related functions. Um, you're going to have a stock rooms uh, where they've got shelving and rackings. Um, there'll be staff areas, maybe like a, depending on the size of the retail store, you're going to have maybe like a, either a, if it's a small one, you just have a small area in the back. Um, uh, where, where your staff would maybe take breaks or lunch breaks, and um, if it's a larger store, you get definitely larger, larger canteen, cafeteria type of areas. And, and so, at this point, as we talked about some of the commonalities between some of these type of retail locations, different ones. There's also, um, on, on the contrary, a different set of challenges for each type. Um, as mentioned, um, clothing, clothing is one. Um, that has a, a, its own challenges, usually a smaller footprint than, say, a supermarket or a, a warehouse type of environment. Also, a different type of attenuation object throughout there in terms of product um, dispersed throughout. Um, so, our particular area of retail is fashion and apparel. And as I mentioned, um, again, it's usually a smaller footprint, usually lower ceilings, um, oftentimes, too. A smaller um, number of associates, so smaller number of internal employee devices um, that are used on the network. Um, and even within retail alone, quote fashion retail and apparel retail, um, each retailer, the way they do things and, and their footprint um, differs from one another. And that this yeah. is a perfect a, a perfect um, example of um, Ahmed and I. We both deal with fashion retail, but from two different brands. Yeah, and uh, just to add to what Dale said, um, when when we first met, uh, we we live in two different cities, two different countries, in fact. Uh, but when we first met at a conference, we found there were so many things that were uh, common in terms of infrastructure. Um, you know, uh, the way we configure our access points, the way we configure our Wi-Fi. Um, but there's still some little differences. So um, for the company I work for, there, no retail store is the same. So it's really difficult to um, nail down, you know, maybe the ceiling heights or um, where we can mount the APs in some of these locations, we find that um, sometimes you get the, uh, and this may be a struggle for you.
von ähm, So, um, yeah. voice uh, overlay design network yep and, and then a third one that we don't have on here but um another type of design is a location um based design a lot of times where that may require more access points um we don't do that today that type of design but um that may require more access points because usually from for any given area there's some triangulate triangulation uh sorry yeah triangulation that needs to take place and um from any point any given point um, the client device should be able to see at least three different access points um, for for the location uh, services. One uh, one question that I, I thought of on this topic too is, you know, uh, you know, you're kind of talking about it. Sounds like almost trying to future proof, you know, the network a bit, right? Of kind of seeing where trends are going and what you might need to support in the future. Where does um, kind of refresh cycle factor into this? Do you guys do, um, do you guys have like a certain number of years or something that you're trying to anticipate this network is going to be in use for or you know how does that play into this you know network objectives kind of decision so from uh, from my side we typically uh, plan for a, at least five years we're currently at that phase where we have some uh, Cisco legacy or not legacy but traditional uh, controller based access points uh, we use 2702s but now um, there's, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit towards the end of the webinar about managing um, on a large scale. Um, and we find that Meraki is a little bit more easier to manage than um, individual APs uh, using a Cisco-based controller. 
um, just the, the way you can do templates and stuff like that. So yeah, our, our average life cycle, I think, is about five, just about five years. Yeah, in our case, um, we, we like to keep it about five years, but uh, um, it's been a little bit over. But we're actually in the middle of a refresh project right now, so we are going to be transitioning towards some AX-capable access points and technology. And along nice. with that, sometimes you also got to look at the, um, the the wired infrastructure to support some of that, um, you know, higher capacity uh, um, uh, switch ports and stuff. Um, M gig, for example, is what they what they call it. Um, so a lot of times those newer APs can support 2.5 gigahertz uh, per second or gigabits per second or five gigabits per second versus um, one gig um, uplink ports. Very cool. Nice. That makes sense. And then, and, and then we talk about some of the different types of devices in retail environment. And um, in, in particular, we have a lot of iOS devices that we use in different ways, um, and that being iPads and iPods, um, some for mobile point of sale. Um, um, there's inventory scanning. Uh, iPads could be used for kiosk or a sales associate web access. Um, and then, in top, you know, alongside that, we also have to account for the devices when we offer guest Wi-Fi or customer hotspot, some of the devices that might be brought into our environments. We have to, um, or it's good practice, it's a good idea to make sure that there's a good customer experience with their devices when utilizing our wireless network. Yeah, just to add to what Dale said, so um, we also want to make sure that if it's, um, you know, the devices that we're having on our own um, employee network or, or the business network that we're using for for business related functions we want to make sure that we're trying to avoid you know people that may have just found been sold by some sales guy <laughs> you know like a B, B only device um, we, we, we don't want to use those legacy kind of standards um, try to always push um, your your retail teams that are doing those purchases to buy you know at least something that's n capable um, five gigs is always always uh, recommended as well. We just give it, and again, I keep saying this. We we'll talk about some of these other challenges that you experience when you're in like larger malls and, and stuff like that. Um, and then what we're really seeing uh, again in both of our uh, companies is the, the use of um, Apple or Android devices is sort of pushing these older, um, sort of digital, you know, legacy kind of. Um, the device that you see on the left hand side of the screen um, so uh, there's things like RFID uh, we're using with uh, our uh, iPods or even now we're using iPhones in our, some of our locations uh, they are just more faster more um, better support better um, hardware in them uh, and the more and more so I've seen in the last five years it's really changed from um, the applications that we're running on the maybe the handheld scanners on the left um, and those have kind of like shifted on to the, 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 the Apple devices. So it's quite interesting. Yeah. And, and another thing to be aware of, too, when you deal with some of the legacy devices, for example, if you have um, B um, enabled, 802.11B, that does degrade, potentially degrade the experience for everybody, everybody on that wireless network. So oftentimes we, we, we want to have that happy compromise and kind of keep B um, on 2.4 gigahertz band, we want to keep that off um, or disabled usually. In, in the case, in my case at least, as I did, as I design networks. And also another thing to keep in mind too is um, staying on top of the technology. For example, as I mentioned, we have iOS devices. There's certain features um, that can be utilized to help the APs help the devices make better roaming decisions for better overall performance. Um, some of those features are standards known as um, 802.11K, R, and V. Some of those things, um, for example, it's good to know which devices can utilize those features and which devices cannot utilize those features and functionalities. Yeah, and just to um, sort of end on, on that slide, um, sorry. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if, if you want to um, also consider that, um, you know, design, I mentioned it earlier, design for the most critical device. So um, in our environment, the, that payment device, which is the iPod, we, we make sure that we are designing um, for that device specifically and, and the other stuff is critical, but not as critical as that. 
So if, if, if the payment device is, is kind of offline or, or not performing well, then we're, we're definitely getting calls for those issues. Yeah, anything that uh, involves uh, interrupting uh, collecting money is usually uh, has a little higher uh, critical factor yeah. applied to it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so yeah, we'll just move on to some uh, technical recommendations from um, from our experiences uh, in, in our space that we work with. So when we talk about technical recommendations, um, requirements gathering, that's one of the first things that, um, that's one of the most important things as you do design your network, understand the requirements. Um, part of that is understanding what are the primary purposes for Wi-Fi in that given environment. So what do we hope to solve with that wireless network, that Wi-Fi network? Um, I mean, what are, in, in your case, what are some of the um, purposes or use cases for your wireless network? Um, I know you mentioned a few. Yeah, so um, I think when, when I started with the company I'm with right now, it was really just um, wired POS transactions paid at the, at the counter. We did have some very basic wireless with um, some Motorola handheld scanners, um, but what I've really seen um, is a shift in, um, you know, getting things like uh, custom engagement. Uh, if someone's sort of, at, you know, looking at a product, we can have our staff walk up to them. Uh, tell them a bit more about the product and make the sale right there, and that increases revenue a lot. Um, whereas you know they traditionally just go up to the the, the, the checkouts and, and pay for it. So use, using um, the mobile point of sale is probably the number one thing. The second thing is uh, inventory scanning um, on a much faster scale. So I mentioned earlier we use use technologies like RFID. So before they would have to do a count of every product. Now they have this uh, RFID technology where they can get an Apple device with um, with an RFID wand and just kind of wave it through the merchandise and it cuts the time to sort of check out the inventory and, and counts um, to a matter of seconds, whereas before it, was, you know, it could be you know, minutes or even hours. <clears throat> so there's definitely that use on there and also um, just the use of collaboration at our back office for for our staff, and also now uh, we're, do, we're doing a lot of uh, guest Wi-Fi for customers as well. So, um, you know, people go to the store and and they they want maybe they don't have such a great signal on the cellular, um, so then they can switch over to our guest Wi-Fi and use that. So we're gonna try to make that best experience as possible. Yeah, I'd say and, and one the, thing that. Oh, sorry, Dale. Oh, no what problem. Were you now, I was just going to say, very similar in my environment, um, you know, a lot of times with, with Wi-Fi, what it does, obviously, is it gives you the option for mobility. So, as in the past, um, a lot of times, for someone to be connected to the web, they have to be stationary. Um, with mobile devices and the mobile applications, now that restriction is pretty much gone. Um, sales associate essentially can have a mobile device. East associate can have a mobile device and have web access, can do mobile point of sale. So essentially with that, in doing mobile point of sale um, on a handheld device, you free up a cash register, a standalone cash register, and can take transactions all throughout the location or throughout the uh, store environment. And, um, and, and as I mentioned, also customer hotspot. There are oftentimes um, situations where deep within malls, cellular coverage is poor. So in those cases, you don't want to have the customer, for example, if they utilize your mobile application, um, or, or even have an email with coupon in it, you want them to be able to access that and not be restricted um, just due to the cellular coverage. So that, that's some use cases in our environment. Nice. Yeah, was, and, we're, and just, sorry, Jerry, just before um, we jump in, I just wanted to say, yeah, we're also seeing like a lot of IoT type of stuff going in. So um, cameras, um, not just the surveillance cameras, but um, uh, analytics cameras where they kind of uh, we're piloting some stuff where we, we you know, we get um, information about people coming into our schools as well. Nice. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, and I'm curious if you guys have seen any of this or explored this at all. But you know, I know one thing that was a huge game changer for me of the the retail experience was like going into like a busy, uh, you know, Apple store and dreading the whole, um, you know, okay, I find the product that I want. And now I've got to stand in line for, you know, five, 10 minutes just to check out this, you know, $20 accessory or something. I just need a new charger for my phone or something. And, uh, you know, when they added the ability where I can have the 
on my phone and I can pick up that product, scan it with my phone, pay for it and walk out of the store and never even, you know, interact with somebody in the store. You know, that was a huge game changer for me on the, the retail experience front. Uh, sounds like you guys are kind of crossing that bridge with, you know, having people walking around with devices and being able to uh, scan that merchandise right there and, you know, check them out right there without having to stand in line for a, a register. Is that, uh, is that something you guys are exploring as well? Um, yeah, I, 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 sh I, sorry, go ahead, Dale. Oh, no problem. Uh, you, 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 right? Yeah, I have, I haven't seen it. Um, what you just mentioned there in, in our stores or uh, any mention of that, like just, we do the, do the walk up and you could do the purchase like you traditionally you could do an Apple store, but I didn't know that you could scan it. Your, you can scan it yourself and pay for it. I didn't, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing anything with self-payment at, at the time, but um, I, I'm sure it will become an increasingly proper, popular trend in retail environments. Yeah, I think just the, uh, you know, even just the yeah people being able to walk around and check you out right where you are and not have to go stand in this, you know, long line, uh, you know, uh, for, for a one or two cash registers or something like that, I think is, a, you know, a huge step in the right direction and makes the retail experience that much more enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. And that goes a long way. I mean, a lot of times if you have a bad experience, you're going to remember that and it might um, stop you from returning, being a return customer. Or on the contrary, you know, if you have a good experience um, through word of mouth, you might spread that good experience to others. And suddenly, um, you know, you have a you acquire more customers, a, more, a larger customer base just off of that experience from one person. So it can definitely go a long way. Right on. And then... Um, Another thing is when you require um, do your requirements gathering is um, it's good to define the performance expectations. And by that, I mean knowing which applications are more critical than others, which ones can handle latency versus which ones cannot handle latency. Um, it's important to understand where you might have to apply QoS, for example, for voice. Um, you, you usually want to have good high QoS policy on that because all the devices compete for the same airtime so you have to do some prioritization um so that's again like voices i mentioned is one case where we do that type of prioritization i know also there's some features and functionalities with apple devices in the cisco infrastructure that you can utilize i think they call it fast lane in which you can do some um application prioritization um amit are do you do any traffic prioritization in your environment um actually we are working with um some of our developers who, who who create our apps, and um, especially again, just going back to that mobile POS application, we are kind of getting them to write in um, the the DSCP markings um, for um, you know prioritizing that over other traffic in our source. So uh, we, we we're we're not there yet, but we are, it's something that's in the pipeline. Yeah. Okay. No. Maybe I missed this part, but what's the um, what's the voice piece used for? Is that like um, internal kind of communication within staff of the store? Or are you doing like actual uh, phone calls over that, or what? What's the voice piece used for? Yeah, so so in my environment, those voice phones usually like for example, you go on Google, look up a store number. I mean, look up a certain store location. You want to call, find mm -hmm. out the hours, or talk with a sales associate. Um, every store has a voice over IP phone, so. That's one of the one of the ways they use it. Also, whenever the store has to call into the help desk, um, they use those phones for that. Um, so that's their primary phone for that store, actually, internally. That that's our yeah. main concern, making sure that they have a good prioritization. What about you know, like just more of like a walkie-talkie style thing? Are you guys using it for anything like that? Just to communicate within like the the staff that's currently working, or is it specifically for uh, for phone calls? I know in one of our DC environments, um, they were doing some walkie-talkie type, type things, but not in our retail locations, at least today. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I think I think I echo what Dan is saying. I just I think given the size of the the store, um, from my understanding, we don't use any uh, so-called push-to-talk or, or walkie-talkie kind of devices. Okay. And, and, and I just want to add. Sorry, yeah. Just want to add to um, what Dan's uh, second point. Uh, the, the expectations is, um, you know, 
uh, and this is more from maybe uh, the rest of IT and uh, the ma like our management. So you know they'll get a cheap one gig circuit into the store, and they'll think, hey, we can get one gig on the Wi-Fi, um, and you know expect us to do 80 megahertz wide channels. And why can't we? Why are we only getting like maybe 100 meg through the Wi-Fi, depending on the channel width, um, and 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 the techno the the Wi-Fi um, standard that that, is, that device supports. But we had to accept those expectations. And, and explain to them that sure we have one gig circuit came coming in just because you got that from ATMT or, or Verizon for really cheap, but we can't uh, you know we can't give you that bandwidth due to the, the capacity requirements, the neighboring Wi-Fi uh, interference I would get if we're using anything uh, larger than the 40 megahertz wide channel. So just wanted to throw that uh, out there too. Yep. And, and then another thing we have um, when you do the requirements gathering is budgetary considerations. So for example. Um, when you analyze and assess which type of AP access point hardware should be deployed. Um, there's a, a spectrum of hardware, access point hardware available. You can go from some higher end type of um, hardware to some lower end. It, it's all a matter of what type of um, budget you have towards your Wi-Fi deployment. Um, some, some, some companies do it a little better than others. And, um, but again, there's budgetary constraints and concerns that you have to take into account. Um, any, does that apply to you at all, um, Amit? Any, any yeah, other type of def de definitely. For the budgetary side, we um, so we standardize on um, a certain model of Cisco access point uh, across all of our uh, stores, but then we uh, sometimes get these seasonal stores or uh, pop-ups, which are much cheaper. They don't even make them look like a uh, like a typical store. It's just like a space that they grab for maybe three to nine months. Any, any, anything between that, and they maybe want to figure out what the market is in that area before they decide to open a full-on store. So um, yeah, we'd, we'd definitely consider maybe like a, a lower end access point, maybe like an 1800 or, or something cheaper to fit in that budget. Uh, maybe not even have the same amount of access points, don't design for voice, but just put, put one AP or, or two APs in just for the coverage perspective. So yeah, definitely um, some of those we run into. Yeah. And even in our case, sometimes there's a store which might be a flagship store that has a lot more traffic versus a store that doesn't have much traffic. Um, you're going to put more budget into that larger store um, and make sure they have a, a really good experience versus um, you, you kind of weigh out the investment for a store that doesn't have much traffic. Um, you might not want to put as much into that location. So that's some of the um, budget, budgetary considerations that we account for. And then an, another thing is, um, we talk about resiliency and high availability considerations. And by that, I'm talking about um, for controllers, for example, your wireless controllers, you want to have redundancy in case one controller goes down. Um, you want to make sure that um, connectivity isn't sacrificed at that. It's not at the expense of the connection for that, for either the customer or the employee. So um, you want to account for redundancy there, but also in some cases resiliency as far as primary, secondary, and even um, tertiary RF coverage. So for example, if one access point goes down and if it's in a critical area or location of that store, um, you wanna make sure that users can still continue to connect to the Wi-Fi without, um, without a problem. Because again, that, that too can be a case of um, losing out on sales or having a bad customer experience. Not even a bad customer experience, but also a bad associate experience, which can go a long way as well. Um, I, I know, and dealing with the help, being a help desk member in the past, sometimes you you have people who think every issue related to a Wi-Fi device that they have is a wireless issue, and uh, sometimes they do get a little impatient, and you may hear things like, "Oh, I hate Wi-Fi," or "Wi-Fi sucks," and things of that nature. So you do want to kind of keep that stuff to a minimal. Hey Dale, do you also uh, build in any uh, redundancy to your like? Um so, so the APs uh, maybe connect to multiple switches or like yeah, uh, redundant uh, routers, internet links, um, 4G backups, anything like that? So on, our, on the network side of things, I mean, we do have a primary connection in PLS and then a secondary internet connection, um, DM, VPN back to our data center. So we have redundancy in that regard. As far as, um, you know, the uplink redundancy, or everything just goes to a single switch port for the most part. In some cases, we do have a switch stack but in most cases, um, that's not that's not the situation for a single store. 
for sure. Yeah, I can it definitely that goes back to that point before uh, the budgetary constraints probably falls on that. Um, I, I can echo the same thing as well. So, so if you're so if I'm hearing this correctly, you're saying I can't just place one access point in the middle of the store and crank up the transmit power and call it a day. You can if you want, but uh, I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not recommended. That, I mean, that that used to be the reality, though, right? I mean, not that many years ago, it was just, you know, about coverage, right? And, you know, you talk about, you know, your, your point of sale machines, you know, they're static. They just stayed in one place in the store. We could put an access point above those and know we're going to be good. But, you know, everything that we're talking through here, that's a lot of considerations, you know, especially when you start getting into this high availability and the Wi-Fi being critical to processing payments and you know things moving around the store there's a lot of design considerations there to you know figure out the right number of access points and where those access points should be placed but in reality one access point i would think probably could cover a lot of the stores from a, a coverage standpoint right but it's not going to meet the, the the considerations that we're talking about here yeah right. so i've i've also i've always had um like a manager or someone saying oh yeah you know, just put one AP every 2,500 square feet, and that that should cover it. So we've got a store which is seven 7,500 square foot. Three APs is is perfect, and I've always tried to kind of push back and say, no, there's we've got to look at each store individually. Um, we're talking about like different building material, the way the buildings made of kind of construction materials. Um, every store has a different layout. There's just so many uh, factors in. So nailing those requirements down from the beginning, including um, you know things what the materials or, or um, uh, what kind of uh, objects you have in a store are huge you can't just kind of put your finger up in the air and and, and say yeah 2500 square foot just place an AP in the middle of every every location like that yeah yeah absolutely because even in some some stores of ours I mean you have HVAC material in the ceiling um, there might be pillars made out of different um, materials that Wi-Fi signal can't really pass through quite so well. So yeah, there's there's a lot of considerations taken into account. Cool. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, another thing that's really important is um, you know paying importance to of, of details. Um, there can be costly. Um, you know fines that you pay if you're if you're not in in compliance um, or you're negligent in in some of these uh, points that we're just going to talk about here. So um, regulatory domains um, we're talking about here specifically uh, AP regulatory domains where uh, certain frequencies can not be used uh, depending which part of the world you're in. So um, I, I can tell you uh, right now from um, I'm actually from the UK originally, but they have different um, uh, Ofcom, which is the regulatory standard out there, has a different uh, allowance for five gig channels that you can use. I think they've opened a few more up, but they, they're different to what the US has. And Canada, where I'm right now, also has different um, channels that, that can be used. So make sure you're uh, either sending the right APs, uh, number one, to the right country that they're going to be used in, um, and make sure they're enabled for the right country that they're actually in. Um, otherwise, you could you know, I'm not saying that there's going to be some someone coming at your door if you've got you know one store uh, or even a few of your stores with that wrong domain configured, but you you, you want to be on the safe side of that. Um, so yeah, and, and, and to your point there, I mean, like for example, I I, I believe with your company, but also my company um, that operates globally. So we have stores in the um, United States, Canada, Mexico, and uh, Asia Pacific. Each yeah. of those has different types of um, regulatory domains and um, model access points that we have to use. And sometimes it has been the case that we may have accidentally shipped out, for example, an access point um, for the U.S. to Hong Kong, for example. And initially, um, that AP will be configured with for country code Hong Kong, but it's a United States model access point, and it won't work. So, um, you know, we can get that to work technically, but there are risks involved with doing that. You can be fined and get in trouble for that, so you want to definitely avoid that and and such. But I, from what I understand, there are certain access points out there now, and I believe that um you can send out any type of model, and I think the software takes care of the rest. Yeah, typically uh, we're we're starting to roll out Meraki, and and we find that that's 
definitely better than the, the Cisco APs where you have to send a specific AP to that region of America, you just install it and then it, it you, you just define once which region. It's kind of like a universal access point. Um, I'll just move on to uh, also an uh, important one is the uh, PCI DSS. So that's for the payment card industry uh, compliance. Um, so for any Wi-Fi networks you, you're putting on, you always want to ensure that you're um, you know standard standardized on uh, using WPA2 under 802.11i. And uh, we also um, in our environment, and I, I re highly recommend uh, you use some sort of PKI um, for your. Uh, PCI devices, so those payment mobile payment devices I'm talking about. Um, you want to try use something like ETLS to do the authentication um, on, you know, for those devices, and avoid using PSKs. Yeah, you definitely want to keep it secure. Um, you, you don't want to have your company um, be the victim of a of a hacker or hackers and have um, credit card information uh, compromised on the customers. Um, that definitely could be detrimental to the company's um, existence. So you definitely want to have that information secure and have good security around your Wi-Fi. And then we talk about, um, you know, the potential cost of having physically unsecure hardware. Um, I, I, it may be something that's overlooked, but a lot of times it, it is actually the reality that access points aren't mounted securely to the bracket and can fall off, especially some of the uh, heavier and bigger access points out there. Um, you know, that, that could be pretty bad, so to speak. So um, one of the practices that we have, and we, we made it one of our standards, is to have the access point zip tied to the mounting bracket. Um, some of the other access points that we're um, considering deploying actually have a security screw to um, make sure that access point is secured to the mount and bracket through that security screw. So those are also things that shouldn't be overlooked. And that's what we mean by um, importance of detail. And then we talk about the number of SSIDs. Um, now, initially, it was the case where we had a ton of SSIDs out there, and, and in some cases, it's still the still the matter of or the reality of um, of the situation. But it is recommended to have somewhere from three to four SSIDs maps. Um, oftentimes, you want to have one for your voice network, um, one that's open for your for your guests customer hotspot network and then one for your internal network that has um, some of that security uh, that I had mentioned in the previous slide. Um, the more SSIDs you have out there, um, the more overhead and that can impact the experience and even time for a device to connect to the network. Yeah, and, and, and so what I've seen in my environment is, uh, and, and you know, I'm also guilty of this before I really got into Wi-Fi in the last uh, three or four years. Every time our security team would uh, mention something about PCI, and they would make it mandatory that obviously we have a separate VLAN for those devices, the firewall off completely separately, and they would throw the you know the requirement in of have it have it on another SSID. And so we we got to a point where at some of our larger stores, you know, there was like eight SSIDs on both 2.4 and 5, and then the more kind of Sort of delved into Wi-Fi and, and became more of an expert in, in, in the field, then we, you know, I assume made that recommendation that yeah, we, we need to get rid of these. The main thing is you, you want to keep your channel utilization down, um, and the more the more SSIDs you have, the the, the more that um, increases the issues, and as the number of APs also you have also increase that issue. So um, yeah, keep 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 them as yeah. uh, low as possible. Try to use dynamic VLAN assignment uh, through like a radius or a, or a, or a, um, uh, a NAC server to uh, profile the device and say, okay, this is maybe like a uh, retail SSID, but based on this device's uh, signature or profile or, or some other maybe a, a field in the certificate or something like that, place it in VLAN 10 instead of putting in VLAN 20. Um, and so that we're just we're going to just quickly go over you know designing for coverage uh, versus uh, capacity. So um, on the left side you got a coverage only model where you know, those devices you can see there they're not really doing anything that is voice related. They're all very um, low transactional data. So you know you might have that requirement when you're just using those devices. Um, sorry, did someone say something? 
Okay, uh, my bad. Uh, so uh, yeah, so you you just have that low transactional uh, amount of data being sent uh, across the network. Um, you don't necessarily need to you know put a lot of APs in there. You can as long as you meet the requirements for those devices, um, you, you can. Uh, maybe your budget says that no, we don't need voice. So you know, put the put the least amount of APs in to support these devices that we have on the left. Um, and then. Yep. On the right hand side, we've got the uh, guests or um, employees networks where, you know, depending on the environment, um, if there's like a busy time uh, or busy event or like a Black Friday or, you know, a Boxing Day, you may have a lot more uh, customers in, um, in in the stores as well. So you, you to support them on the Wi-Fi, you want to make sure that you're creating more of a capacity based network, more access points, smaller cells. Um, um, potentially uh, decreasing the data rates, uh, minimum data rates on there, and uh, just creating enough capacity for bandwidth for them to to use the use the Wi-Fi network. Yeah, yeah. And to your point, as you mentioned, more APs to handle higher capacity, um, and so and the, and the smaller sales there. So, for example, when you do have the customer hotspot locations, um, in a retail environment, you know the the number of traffic, number of users with mobile devices that can fluctuate. Um, you can almost uh, quadruple, for example, your number of client devices versus if you're just on an internal network here, associates, your sales associates have a mobile device. Let's say maybe five employees each have an iPod device each, maybe a couple even have an iPad. Um, so let's say that's like seven devices at a given time. But then you add the customer hotspot um, and the, the mobile device users with that associated with those. Um, and then that, could, that you know, that uh, multiplies fast. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you have all those, all those clients competing for airtime on the same channel. When you have more access points, um, you alleviate some of that. You have multiple channels for those clients to connect and um, associate with that corresponding access points. And then we talk about access point mounting. Um, it's, important to, it's important to have, based on what type of access points you have, and the internal or the antennas with those. For example, our standard access point is a um, internal antenna access point. And we like to keep that within, typically for us, within the 10 to 12, 14 feet high range. Um, when we go <laughs> above that, then we, then we start to consider some external antennas as mentioned, um, you know, towards the beginning of this presentation. So, um, it's the best practice that we found to actually define what those mounting heights and standards should be. And in some cases, if that means lowering the access points to the use of all thread and or um, some type of conduit from the ceiling, then that, that's what we have to do. And you can kind of see an example of that um, out of these three pictures here. This bottom rightmost one, it's lower from the ceiling. So that's an example of um, what we do in some cases. Yeah. and. Um Again, you might not have, you know, all the all the ceilings the same. Uh, you may have uh, air conditioning ducts. You could have uh, tons of metal types of um, uh, fixtures up there for lighting, uh, speakers. So you want to make sure you're not keeping those APs all the way mounted onto the onto a flat ceiling. Um, try to use that conduit that Dale mentioned to keep the AP sort of just below um, all that all those metal objects. Otherwise, you've, you've definitely run into some um, lot of reflection and um, potentially performance issues as well. Yep. And I've noticed even in some cases um, with our stores where we have um, stockroom shelves in the back areas where there's been situations where the associates report that they have poor connectivity there or the, the signal doesn't seem to penetrate so well back there, we've actually deployed some directional pack antennas um, wall mounted and shooting in that direction. and um, that, that gives them a better experience in some locations. And uh, we'll just touch upon uh, some antenna selection. So obviously there's two types of really antennas that, that we have um, in use for indoor Wi-Fi. Um, and so you've got uh, a patch antennas or you've got in, uh, omnidirectionals. So um, typically on a, um, on a ceiling where you have, you know, you, you don't have a choice but to mount the APs um, something like 18 to 25 feet high, consider using uh, directional antennas 
pointing downwards. Um, you can also use directional antennas uh, up on the walls as well, um, depending on uh, racking and um, maybe like a stockroom area or a, or a warehouse. Um, but typically, Omnis can work well, at least in the smaller retail spaces where the ceiling is uh, below that sort of 50, uh, under 20 feet, you would say. Yep. And and in some situations, even if um if you do have challenges or problems um, dropping those access points from the ceilings, there's even some mounting brackets available. A lot of times, some right angle brackets, for example. There's a number of vendors that that um, manufacture those. Um, some even custom if you need them to be. But um, you can even have those mounted up against the wall and have the access point mounted on that if you're having problems or, or it's a challenge to have them um, suspended or mounted directly against the ceiling. And then we talk about some of the challenges within retail environments. Um, for one, retail environments can be ever-changing. So for example, I mean, um, maybe not within you know, your your own given retail um, chain or store, but your neighboring retailers. So, for example, you may have one neighboring retailer on, on the left-hand side, another on the right-hand side. They have a bunch of access points. They might even have, um, I, I know, for example, we had broadcast, we had um, a customer Wi-Fi that was the same customer Wi-Fi from a different, um, from a different retailer, but this, the SSID name was the same. It was the solution was provided by the same the same vendor, and um, sometimes we'd have associates within our store connecting to the um, customer hotspot within that other retailers um, and having a poor experience. And we've even had situations where we've had a retailer um, ask us, call us up, and ask us, "Can you turn down the signal or the, the um, power on your access point so that it can stop broadcasting into our space?" So. Um, so that's one of the things, one of the problems you deal with with uh, neighboring retailers. Um, another thing, why how is it ever changing is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is uh, the customer traffic. Um, Black Friday, as I had mentioned previously, is one situation where you're, uh, suddenly you can have perhaps nearly 50 to 100 extra customers than you, you know your normal time, um, the normal operation um, periods and in, in hours. Um, and with that, with the customers, a lot of times they may even have customer hotspot enabled on their phones. A lot of times that's um, 2.4 gigahertz, but still that adds to a lot of the interference out there and it can impact your own environment. And then um, alongside that too is the product attenuation. By that, it can often be, oftentimes be overlooked that um, clothing, the type of clothing on the shelves, um, that definitely has some attenuation uh, loss with that, so you have to factor that in, and it's good to understand what type of loss that does present, so um, you have optimal design. Amit, uh, do you have any challenges in those regards? Yeah, so um, we definitely we definitely had um, some. If you if you if you look at your um, NMS or whatever you use to manage your Wi-Fi, if you do a, a a scan or something, you can see that you know there's a lot of um, Customers, uh, other, sorry, other other companies who are you know in, in stores and they've just got the default settings, so they're blasting the APs at full power, um, using 80 megahertz wide channels. Um, then you got the malls Wi-Fi. You, you're constantly battling with everyone around you, like yeah, especially if it's a multi-story um, building as well or multi-story mall. Uh, we found there's definitely some challenges in in maintaining uh, a good RF uh, in, in there. Mhm. Mm and then another set of challenges that we're often posed with are some of those that relate to um, our, our sites being um, leased, leased sites. So that's in terms of real estate. So, um, for example, internet circuit um, constraints. Certain malls don't let, for example, there might not be Ethernet available. There might not be fiber available. You have certain things like that. There's some restrictions there. Or um, when we talk about some cabling constraints and considerations, okay, you might not be able to have um, – Ethernet cabling run through this portion of that site or this portion of the space or the mall. Um, in some cases, we even see only only the union workers in that area are allowed to do any of the cabling work. Um, so that's some of the challenges we deal with as well. So definitely something to be aware of and take into consideration. And then also with some of those locations, you do have um, reflective and obstructive material, such as some of the HVAC um, stuff and pipes 
um, that we mentioned, um, those can definitely get in the way of your Wi-Fi signal. And you got to work around those, and it's not like you can just move those at will. Um, do you, do you pretty much find that the same way amid in your environment? Um, we have we, we do have some uh, constraints actually on the internet um, circuits, uh, cabling constraints probably not so much. We have uh, third party vendors kind of doing the installs for everything. Um, so I think that the things like Union or um, where we can sort of run the cables is not really an issue. Yeah. And and we have a usually for us it's not the Wi-Fi engineer itself that has to deal with that. We have a separate team that deals with that stuff. But those are definitely issues that we've um, been faced with and have to take into consideration. Yeah. Um, just quickly to touch on uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each band. So obviously you're going to get cheaper devices um, that that your company may purchase, uh, but they're only 2.4. Um, as you all should know, 2.4 is uh, overcrowded. There's, there's tons of um, non-Wi-Fi devices that also interfere with that band. Um, yeah, you have more range on it, but that's not really useful, um, at least for what we want to be doing with the Wi-Fi designs in, in today's networks. So um, what we recommend is always try to use um, five gigs um, as possible. Make sure your devices support those five gigs um, bands, the five gig band. Um, you, you also want to be um, careful of um, what channels your devices support as well, because you don't want to put something into your channel plan um, in like your RRM, and the, you know the device does not support those channels. So your AP would be operating on that channel, but the device doesn't. So it just sees a black hole there. Um, so so those are definitely some things to bear in mind. Um, five gigs much cleaner. You definitely get a lot more performance on there. A lot more channels to use, um, and then we'll just talk about. Um, the size of channels on the next slide. Yeah, and, and with with some of that on five gigahertz, so one one interesting thing we see in some of our locations are our radar events um, on some of the DFS channels. So you actually have um, clients get disconnected all of a sudden if a radar event um, occurs because um, the AP has to instantly change its channel and cannot rejoin that channel for I think at least in our case for the United States um, another thirty minutes. So sometimes, well, oftentimes when that occurs, that is disruptive. So here we talk about making a good channel design. Um, again, taking into consideration some of those DFS events. Sometimes you don't always know that stuff up front. Um, it's best if, if you can get that information up front, it's, it's best. But when it does occur, it's good to take note of that. And in some cases, you may have to create a, um, what's called an RF profile, especially for those type of situations where you have those channels uh, disabled for a particular subset of sites versus the rest of the um, sites in your organization. Yeah, and um, so just going back on that, so using uh, 20 megahertz Y channels in 2.4 is a given. Don't ever use anything larger than that. Um, even in five gigs, um, I personally just prefer, given the crowded RF space we have, and there's so many new models of APs out there now, that um, customers, uh, sorry, other 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 shops or stores are using, the malls are using, they're also using five gigs. So I'd, I'd personally recommend sticking with 20 megahertz wide. If there's an absolute use case, you could consider 40, but don't go anything above that. Um, and then, so not everything is um, not everything is a, a Wi-Fi problem, right? So typically, we always the first thing you hear, whether it's in an enterprise office, warehouse, or even a store, is always that the, the, the Wi-Fi sucks or there's something wrong with Wi-Fi. But that's not always the case. Um, there could be issues with internet or WAN circuits. Um, applications could be, you know, configured wrong or someone made a change um, on the on the back end. And you know that's actually causing the, the issue, not the Wi-Fi. And then you've also got maybe slow DNS or uh, slow DHCP, or you know, you, I'm sure everyone's had that call or ticket or someone complaining about we can't connect to Wi-Fi. But it, it's not always that. It could be DHCP is not giving out an address, and your iPhone just tells you could not connect to network. So um, you, you should consider all those things. Um, and then also the, the you know sometimes. 
you may not have a chance to review right away that um, how the install was. Maybe the install is bad. Maybe the access points installed upside down. Um, I've seen them installed completely under, um, you know, all the metal ducts that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, so you have to keep an eye on all, the, all those things, take those into consideration and consider that you may need to get those um, remediated. And, and, and to your point with some of that stuff, when, as you talked about the internet and WAN circuit issues, one of the things we were seeing at one point, for example, was the cap rat traffic um, from the access points back to the controllers, that tunnel, um, that circuit, the circuit at the location, the primary uh, internet circuit would be overutilized and being that we didn't have at the time QoS uh, marked for that appropriately to give that cap web traffic prioritization, um, the, the connection from the AP to the controller would be um, sacrificed and lost. So one thing we started doing was, um, well, we, we did prioritize that traffic, but also started taking advantage of um, multiple circuits. Um, SD-WAN is one way to accomplish that but also um, performance routing or policy-based routing, we, we started doing some of that stuff so that um, some of the traffic does utilize that secondary connection instead of going down the primary, all the traffic going through the primary internet circuit. Yeah, and um, so <clears throat> as we're coming towards the end of, um, you know, the, the, pre the, the presentation and apologies, we're running a few minutes late. I'll try to uh, finish these off as quickly as possible. So, um, it, once you're at like ten stores, you know that is, it's it's difficult to manage that, but it's manageable. But once you start going, you know, above ten stores, I mean, Dale has, uh, I think, was it over three thousand? Uh, roughly a thousand stores. Roughly a thousand. So I'm I'm about for just under four hundred and fifty stores. Um, that's when it really gets difficult to um, design deploy and manage and maintain those with real, you know, with quality. So um, there's some recommendations that we have, um, and, and we probably use them, maybe some of them and all of them, but um, using re reliable vendors is, is key. Um, so if you don't have a large budget for an internal team, you obviously have to either support that some way through a, a, a third party vendor. So using those for your um, design, so recommend you know, give them recommendations on and uh, maybe run through a few um, iterations of a store design and where to place access points, uh, where not to place them is obviously key, mounting options and, and it kind of go back and forth with them, let them do a few designs. Once they get comfortable and you're comfortable that they're doing the right types of uh, installs for you or right and the right types of designs, then you can kind of hand that over to them and then do it maybe a, a monthly or quarterly review based on um, those. But you, you definitely, if you, like I said, if you are res restrained on um, re internal resources doing those designs, you're definitely going to have to pass those off. So make sure they, you know, uh, you perform a predictive survey for every location. Don't, don't just go with, uh, you know, something like an AP every 2,500 square feet. That's not going to cut it in a good design. And then once you do get that um, install done, um, re review the survey data, you know, ask them, your vendor, whoever, whoever's doing that survey for you, sh um, they should be providing you the FKL file and you should be reviewing that and making sure that what they've measured is accurate, what they've installed is accurate. Um, look at their reports and look at the installs of their photos to make sure that everything's uh, mounted in the right place. Oftentimes you find there's uh, sometimes a revisit required to you know, either move an AP to a better location or um, add the better mounting option. Um, and then always um, continually ma manage and monitor your networks with your NMS and, and data an analytics so you can see where there's gaps um, or performance issues that have, you know, maybe something, maybe something got changed in the store physically, they moved a ton of stuff around or, um, yeah, something in the environment changed. You, you want to be able to kind of baseline that and, and use some kind of data tool to uh, give you that information. And then you can send uh, someone out to maybe do another survey to see what's different, um, you know, using Echohow as well as a, as a vision inspection as well. Yep. And just a quick recap of some of the things you said there. The reliable vendors is key. You want to have vendors that are familiar with your environment so you have that consistent install experience. The initial deployment rollout is you have um, – certain vendor might be a little tough, but over time they know your environment very well and it's worthwhile. 
Also, what's worthwhile, like you mentioned, is the predictive survey. If you can't do an AP on a stick survey, um, you want to have some type of survey out there. Um, it saves you a lot of money and uh, trouble in the end, in the long term. And then here we start talking about designing for BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, in our environment, at least my environment, I'm not really familiar with um, designing for BLE yet, but that is something that's emerging and up and coming. Um, we'll probably see it more and more um, in locations for customer engagement and interaction. Um, some of the things I do know that can be done with that, for example, is um, if you have a certain app running on your phone, um, there's certain beacons that can point out, for example, if you're one, in one section of the store, let's call it the gene section, it can say, Welcome, Dale. Welcome to the gene section of our store. Um, here's a coupon for that. Um, so those are something to be on the on the lookout for um, and take into consideration because it's definitely going to be something more prevalent out there in the retail environments. Yeah, it definitely helps with the user engagement side of things, um, as Dale mentioned. So uh, it's not something I'm doing yet, but um, we're trying to see if there's any value to add that within our business, and we'll definitely consider that. Um, in the near future. Yeah, you'll find, as you see up here, a lot, all of the, a lot of the vendors nowadays, that is something that they're integrating into their product. So now we'll take a quick look at an example of a predictive survey in Echohow Pro. Here's an example here. Um, in this example, we define two areas, the overall area being area one. Area two we defined as a high density area. Um, more clients in that area. So whenever you do your design, um, it takes that into account and it kind of suggested that the access point goes here and then you can look at different things um, within there to see what your signal will be, at, be like. But again, that's after you define your attenuation objects. In this case, we have walls here. Um, now there are default values for attenuation, um, but it's best to understand in your actual environment with that drywall, for example, with the drywall, loss would be so if you're on this side of the wall for example and you have a negative 65 signal but then you go on this side and you have a negative 60 69 signal for example you know that this is probably a, a 2 db and loss right there so you want to make sure you have all your insinuation objects filled in your wall materials and and whatever else that might be and there's also attenuation objects so for example here we have different shelves you want to understand what the loss would be there, not only for the shelves alone, but for the product that is on the shelves. And that will help you um, with your predictive design so that you can like, for essentially hover over a particular area within that floor plan and understand what your signal should be like, not only from the nearest AP, but all the access points that are out there and defined within your predictive design. And just to add, uh, to Dale's design there, so uh, make sure, so on the, on the left you see a simulated uh, APs, so make sure you, you know, specify the height. By default, I think Echo will put in like 7.6 feet as the default height. Um, so, you know, based on your measurement of um, of the store, or the floor plans that you're given, make sure you input that in and also um, the, the transmit power of the AP, um, ensure that matches uh, what your client device population is as well. So those are definitely some really good things to consider. By default, I've seen a lot of um, people use Echo um, in, in the beginning and just use the defaults and place the APs and think, yeah, they got uh, good Wi-Fi, but they haven't really put in the right inputs to, you know, to get the best um, uh, best uh, performance that they that they could with the design. Yep. And and as you can see here, we have both selected. So that's for a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz design, but you can do one or the other if that's of interest as well. So you do have that flexibility within the software. And then lastly, um, for our slide, we want to talk about enabling for operational efficiency. Basically, technology is supposed to be an enabler, not an hindrance to um, the performance or the experience at that location. Again, not just from a customer experience perspective, but a sales associate's perspective. Um, that sales associate should be able to use technology for certain functions such as mobile point of sale, inventory scanning, different mobile applications. Um, and from the customer side, they should the customer should be able to come into your store, 
and not have to worry about not having a, cell, a cellular signal so that they can um, access uh, their email or coupons or even mobile, even certain app, um, social media applications or anything that might have some type of coupons or incentives for the customer. And to that point with technology, technology should allow for more transactions, more and faster transactions. And essentially transactions equal dollars. And um, also along with that, a good customer experience adds to the good reputation for the retailers. Um, as I mentioned previously, by word of mouth and a good customer experience, that helps you keep, that helps you acquire more customers, but also maintain customers. So um, that, that, you know, the, the customers are the lifeline of, of the business. So you want to definitely keep on adding there and make sure that they're satisfied. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, then lastly, the point that, oh, sorry. The last point that we have here is the sales associates should be able to focus on the customer. You don't want them to have to um, be in the middle of a transaction and have to contact the help desk or um, tell the customer, can you hold on please? We're having technical difficulties. We're having issues. That does add to a bad customer experience, which, um, again, you want to avoid. Yeah, great points, Dale. And um, I think the main thing we have to all remember is if we're designing Wi-Fi, it's because um, the technology that's being pushed through um, our, our retail partners, they're, they're the ones who are pushing these devices out, but we need to support them. But at the end of the day, the, the, the people that are in the stores who are making the sales or the customers that are coming in and buying the product, those are the, you know, that they're the whole reason why number one where where we have a job and number two is um why we why the company makes money so um we we need to be responsible for those and making sure those devices that we're putting in as well as the devices people are bringing in as as customers um work well with the network absolutely and with that we conclude and uh it's time for questions and answers if anybody has any questions for us Elliot, we can uh, we can hand back over to you then. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for attending our webinar. We hope you found value out of this. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you definitely find us out there on the Twitter community, um, or just just out there in the Wi-Fi community. Um, or through Elliot, you can get our contact information as needed and necessary. Thanks again, everyone. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. Bye-bye.